Thank you for being here. Welcome. Um, my name is Lucia Pietrojusti, and I'm Curator of General Ecology at the Serpentine Galleries. Next to me is writer and editor Philippe Paramo. Uh, if you have, uh, like the two of us, like a few of us, been to several others uh, of the General Ecology projects, events, what you're about to hear might sound a bit repetitive. Um, so please bear with me for just two minutes. General uh, ecology, what is the general ecology project at the Serpentine? Well, first of all, we use the word general because we are thinking about ecology, the environment, uh, more than humans, more than humanism, uh, climate change, etc. as subject matters, but also in the methodologies and translations of the principles that are inherent in these subject matters uh, and in the ecological principles such as symbiosis, coevolution, and the interconnection of vast and distributed things that also emerge in other fields of practice. So the idea is to talk about and think about and research around ecology and the environment and so on throughout the work that we do at the Serpentine, be they exhibitions, public programs, education, publication, radio, live events, and to work on it based on principles themselves drawn from the ecological, for example, symbiosis. So working in collaboration, working in networks and so on. So we call this to do ecology all the way in or all the way down. Um, just like every once you have, in a while you have to remember that trees grow in two opposite and simultaneous directions. Um, or that, for example, the forest is not a number of trees, but it's a collaboration between lots of organisms working together. Um, and there are many ways of talking about this, and people are talking about this at the moment, horizontal organization, distributed agency networks, and so on. And you kind of end up at the same diagram when you start to use all these uh, uh, ways of, of uh, talking about organizational structures. But I kind of feel like it ultimately is the image that you choose to have in your head that determines at least the affect and the connections and the qualities of those connections that you end up making through those methodologies. So we prefer to think of forests uh, and of mushrooms, thinking with mushrooms, as the anthropologist Anna Singh says, or working like a mushroom or trying to work like a forest, maybe all of us here. Um, and a big part of general ecology, which is only about a year old and has roots and, well, it just has roots in a lot of the work that hans has told you about, um, has been to develop this series of, we used to call them symposiums, now we're calling them symposia, now we're calling them festivals, because it's <laughs> fun. Uh, w together with Filippa, we, um, the, the series title of which is The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish. Amazing Philippa. And I'll, <laughs> I'll let Amelie, ma Amazing Philippa tell you a little bit about the series and then we'll be back. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here and for being so many. It's, um, it's incredible that we're all together. Somehow the shape of this, of this space with its wooden stairs makes me think of a Theatre Anatomico of an anatomical theater, and uh, somehow um, art and science come together through layers and layers of, of history, and come together through um, an initial collaborator who has been a reference um, for, for both of us and, and for the whole identity of the series, which is this small puffer fish who, um, as part of his um, mating rituals, or maybe also uh, aesthetic rituals, um, draws with his own body, his, because it's the male puffer fishes who do this, um, a circle um, in the sand, which is a drawing or a dance or a form of, of, of creating this form that relates us because we all look at it regardless of being fish or being humans or being humans as fish and we recognize something that brings us together and it was this togetherness and this identifying that we we share um, we share a similar sensibility and a similar pleasure in looking at things especially around things that the series took its name the first um, the first uh, let's say episode session of the uh, symposia now festival, which I like very much since, well, for me, festival makes me think of uh, festa, fiesta, and so it's like a quasi party. Um, 
was on language and communication across machine intelligence, animal intelligence, and human intelligence. It took place um, at the incredible auditorium of the, of the London Zoological Society. It feels ages ago, putting together musicians, um, experts in language communication, animal communication, um, artists, and um, writers, and so on and so forth. I'm sure some of you were there. The second um, event um, was entitled We Have Never uh, Been One, which was a bit of a, of a pun to Bruno Latour's um, fundamental book, We Have Never Been Modern. And it was on symbiosis, internal multitude, uh, metabolic processes, and thinking how different organisms of different sizes and configurations actually constitute uh, one another and how we exist by being traversed by a multitude of, of life forms. Um, there was a moment um, which was part three and a half, plant sex, and I'll hand the plant sex to, to <laughs> Lucia. I'll do the plant sex bit. Uh, so we, did it, we decided to dedicate the whole of the spring 2019 season to plant and the vegetal world in general. And why did we do that? Well, first of all, because uh, they sort of <laughs> sprout up in the spring exhibitions at the Serpentine Galleries, uh, Hito Steyrl, which is now just clo closed, and Emma Kuntz, uh, which, uh, the exhibition of, which Hans, of whom Hans Ulrich has sport, spoken about, Healer and Mystic, incredible person, had a fantastic garden, polarized marigolds. You have to look at the images on the internet. They're great. But also, to a certain extent, because as Emanuele Cocha suggests in The Life of Plants, plants also tend to kind of reside at the somewhat neglected end of the species um, landscape of Earth, both in conservation efforts, which often you'll find tend to focus on large mammals, um, and birds, and birds, and in the way in which we um, define terms such as intelligent, intelligence, intention, consciousness, or even eroticism. Those are all things that we can kind of stretch to the animal, uh, as opposed to non-human animals uh, kingdom. But with plants, it becomes a lot more of a, um, a sort of mental gymnastic. As a result of that, of course, I was, as a result of being somewhat neglected, the vegetal world teaches us an enormous amount by this very fact that it is quite substantially unobserved. And of course, I know that I'm saying this to a room full of people who probably don't at all fit into this description because you're here. <laughs> but let's say that for the sake of argument, it seems like it might just be a question of observing, observing, learning to observe, and, le and knowing, but, or maybe even learning how to know. And everyone who has a plant, at least one plant in their house, will know that they have very different personalities from one another using that uh, term without quotation marks. <laughs> not that, personalities. Um, I always say that a cat helped me not be afraid of ghosts, but that plants helped me not be afraid of being alone. And I think it's really that kind of tuning in, I suppose, of, uh, uh, that, that is a form of observation in itself. So part 3.5 of The Shape of the Circle, which happened before part three, it's just a mess. Uh, was called Plant Sex, and we did it at the French Institute a month ago, uh, and uh, it was because a part of the research for this event sort of grew into its own, uh, uh, well, into its own thing, and became, and will become a series in itself, so Plant Sex will continue, and we were looking at eroticism, and agriculture, and botany, and myth, we also co-edited an issue of a journal called Mal, which you can buy at where you got your up there, um, on the same topic and by the same name, plant sex, all word, uh, one word, all caps. So that piece became a kind of a prelude to today. Um, and in a way, I feel like Kapwani Miranda and Kim's conversation, uh, presentation just before bridges quite powerfully the ideas we were thinking about for um, plant sex as well. Um, in this booklet, which you may have, or you, if you don't, you can get, you will find uh, a roundup of the previous encounters written by Chris Wasilak, who made these 
here with us that sums up very beautifully uh, adding a, a narrative form to what we've been doing. And now, introducing today's, um, today's session, um, and then to hand over to our, um, our next speaker, um, I'd like to, to start by thinking that critical plan studies, and I'm quoting a book series which is edited by one of our guests, by Michael Martyr. So critical plan studies are critical, not because they're dubious or grave, but because they are urgent. Central for critical plan studies is the acknowledgement of plants' intelligence and sensibility, of the manners in which plants make decisions, in which plants plan future actions, respond to stimuli, and react to environmental variables, which can range from light and water, of course, to the presence of animals and of toxic agents. This acknowledgement holds a potential that surpasses the nature-culture debates. The assumption of plant intelligence bears an incredible potential as it pushes us to either redefine these such concepts as learning, memory, cognition, communication, sensibility, uh, which certain researchers began associating to plant activity, or to instead redefine humankind as a species that by admitting that the human doesn't own many of the features that supposedly defined its exceptionality, which they actually share with other life forms, animal and vegetable. The recognition of plant intelligence is also inviting us to consider a political paradigm. Having no localized brain, and no brain on, on, on the top of, of their existence, no separated superior commanding organ, plants demonstrate that another organization system is possible, a system, let's say, in which consciousness and agency are spread out and distributed across entire bodies. A system in which there are no rulers and followers, there's no hierarchic logic that relies on the division between those who take decisions and those who execute them. Plants provide a glimpse to what a society without a centralized brain could become. A celebration of multiple entities whose thinking processes occur through the flesh and which are synchronized by the networks of their nervous systems, equally distributed from their veins to the entirety of their body masses. A society based on the embodied, the reticular, and the sensory. Horizontal, but not flat. Interconnected, but pensive. Spread out and localized. The word capital, deriving from the Latin caput, meaning head or top, and by redistributing the agency across entire beings and groups, plants are triggering the movement of liberation of the body from its capital, from its caput, thus from its potential capitalization. The body without a head is a body that cannot be capitalized, cannot be monetized, and ultimately controlled. It's a body that rediscovers its being natural in its full and visual intelligent manner. And today, we're bringing together a wide variety of voices, standpoints, and approaches to reflect on plant intelligence and on plant sensibility. Kew Gardens, Kew Gardens horticulturist Carlos Magdalena, who in recent years became known in the media as the plant messiah, will take us with him into some of his botanical journeys, sharing episodes, accounts, and experiences of his life dedicated to discovery, and preserving some of the world's rarest plants. Anthropology professor Natasha Myers will invite us to become censor through a hypnagogic, hypnagogic video manifesto shaped by the iridescent contours of the Plantropocene. Vegetize your sensorium, she says, and soon you too can start a revolution in the garden. Also imagining how revolutions are conceived and enacted, Philosopher Michael Marder will analyze seven vegetal characteristics of contemporary political acts and counteracts to reveal how, in fact, we already live in times that are deeply shaped, both ideologically and concretely, by the vegetal world. Plants also invite us to have a radically different perception of time, a non-human-centric temporal system 
not dictated by our sense and of scale and speed. With the invention of the medium of film and with cinema as its, its greater cultural output, time started to be measured, observed, revisited, and repeated. If the cinematic time invented the modern subject, in her talk, film scholar Teresa Castro will comment on how cinema mediates plants. And similarly invested in thinking plants through a time-based media, now through the non-visible, artist Antoine Bertin brings us a listening experience inspired by, the scientific, by scientific work. And today we'll have the opportunity of listening to his re-elaboration of the DNA of plants at the Yamaguchi Forest in Japan. And so the other thing that we wanted to focus on today, um, picking up from fish one language, fish two multitude, as it were, um, so interspecies communication, interior multitude, and symbiosis, um, is when it comes to plant, we're not very far away of when you start to think about communication with the vegetable world and symbiosis with the vegetable world, you're talking about eating plants, all of a sudden you start to talk about um, what the plant tells you when you eat certain specific kinds of plants or mushrooms. Uh, and you're not very far away from questions of mysticism either. So we invited Elvia Wilk and Amy Hollywood to reflect on this later on in the evening. Um, and the connections between those things are maybe a little bit more instinctive than we have necessarily time on stage to sort of discuss. But let's say, for example, divination and therefore religion was always primarily about the weather and the weather was always primarily about agriculture, so plants. And if we don't forget, or if we remember that any kind of predictive or networked technology emerges and was born out of um, weather prediction uh, technologies, or uh, yes, well, technologies all the way back, then uh, those which were always about the weather in the first place, then you have a kind of a plant at the at the root, as it were, it's always metaphor is amazing, uh, at the root of it all again. So how not, not um, how to speak for plants, you know, this notion of giving rights and so on, uh, which is fundamental, but not only, not how to speak for plants, not how to think for plants, but think with, speak with plants. And that I feel like, uh, the more we research, the more it becomes obvious that it necessitates some degree of letting go, just like in any form of communication. Being close, observing, tending to, caring for, and sometimes not understanding, and sometimes letting go. To quote Michael Marder again, what are, he's, he writes, the conditions of possibility for a cross-kingdoms translation, and what is the place of the untranslatable in it? And it's perhaps not a... Um, accident that we close the evening with uh, a wonderful diffusion piece by Chris Watson, which uh, uh, brings again, brings us again together uh, across species, in, in his case, salmon and uh, vegetation and indeed water, which I think, Philippa, you have a couple of things. Vivian and Chris, maybe. And so, before we go, <laughs> as a tribute to the symbiotic relations between different life forms, a thread that has been running across all the uh, fish project, will host Vivian Kakuri's hallucinatory performance lecture, which is entitled The New World Syrup and the Fever Hand, in which the artist will revisit the colonial past and the present day oppressive context of the return of the yellow fever virus in South America. And finally, sound recordist Chris Watson's new multi-channel diffusion piece um, called Salmo Salar, The Three Realms, traces the wild Atlantic salmon's run from the Barents Sea to the source of the river Cocket in Northumberland. Incorporating the sounds of plants and vegetation within the three realms of salt water, fresh water, and air, this soundscape will end the day and bid us farewell with a clear message. The future is plants. Before you clap, I have to do the really, really boring bit. But it's really important because we're so grateful to so many people for uh, allowing us to be here today. First of all, to all the participants. Incredible. Thank you so much for responding to this invitation. The supporters, um, L Acoustics, who uh, 
produce the sound system that's going to be sort of around you, literally around you by the time we get to Chris, um, have co-commissioned the piece by Chris, and that allows us to work with Chris uh, for it to be the first time that Chris Watson works with this 25.1 uh, surround sound. It's so hyper real that the last time we heard it, if you close your eyes, it kind of feels like you're thinking the sound because it's not possible that it comes out of speakers. So <laughs> really incredible. The Institut Français du Royaume-Uni uh, and Fluxus uh, for uh, their support as well. Instituto Inclusatis and Delfina Foundation for the support of Vivian uh, Kakuri's performance and being here. Belmax Gallery for their ongoing uh, uh, support and trust in the shape of a circle um, thing. Uh, Philippa, wow. <laughs> Again, like every time, Philippa, wow. Like, thank you so much. Uh, Costas uh, Stasinopoulos, assistant curator, Holly Shuttleworth, producers, they've really like put the whole thing, I mean, that's, who are we kidding? They've really put the whole thing together. So enormous thanks uh, to them and to Kamala Carey, who's running the uh, uh, technical, pr the production. I always get this wrong because of not being a technical person, but anyways, genius. <laughs> uh, Giles Round for the fig leaves that you see at the back and the visual identity of the program and the overall visual identity for um, uh, general ecology. Uh, in the room, Katerina, Tamar, Rosa, Priya, Earth for the hospitality. This is tomorrow for the live stream. Earth Kitchen for the food, which you can buy in the, well, in the restaurant, in the kitchen. Uh, throughout the day, enjoy your day. Bye. <laughs>